crying out for more. Give me words to speak, to let my spirit sleep. Cause I can't think of anything worth saying, but I know that I owe you my life. So give me words to speak, to let my spirit sleep. So I stand here in silence, awaiting your guidance, I wanting only your voice to be heard. So let them be your words. Let them be your words. And give me words to speak, to let my spirit sleep. I can't think of anything worth saying, but I know that I owe you my life. So give me words to speak, let my spirit sleep. I just don't. Just don't understand. I just don't understand. I just don't understand these lines that I've been leaving. I just don't understand. I just don't understand. spirit sleep cause I can't think of anything worth saying but I know that I owe you my life so give me words to speak to let my spirit sleep give me words to speak to let my spirit sleep. I can't think of anything worth saying. No, that I owe you my life. So give me words to speak. To let my spirit sleep. Calling 
You take the faithless ones aside. You speak the words. You are my Good evening. Jacob's doing a solo right now, or a duet, a duet, I guess, with his dad. It's great. Um, our call to worship today comes from Psalm chapter 105, verses 2 and 3. Oh, but Jacob was up here. Oh, it's 
That's no good. No good. Do you want me to wait? Okay, I will continue on. Um, Psalm 105, verses 2 and 3. Sing to the Lord, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Will you join us in singing this evening and praising our God?
Yes, I'll worship your holy name. Father, we just come to you tonight. We just thank you for this area where we could be all together and worship your name and sing you praise and have you work in our lives. And some of the progress is really slow and sometimes we, we get a step back and then we, we get two steps ahead and we feel like we're in the same place. But we're not because we're held by you, Lord. And you have us in your arms. And you have mercy and tenderness. And you just give us miracles every day. And some of them are just small and we don't see them, but they're there. 
I know they are. We love you and we thank you, Lord, and we're just so glad that we're here to worship you tonight and listen to your word and hear what you have to speak in our hearts and put in our minds and get us through this week and get us ready for next week and just having you in our hearts and in our presence. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. We began praying for musicians, and uh, we got musicians. And then uh, about a year after that, we started praying for our little children, because our nursery had one. The Shreths moved to Korea, and they took three out of the four kids we had. So we started praying. So if you don't like kids running around, crying, screaming, playing the drums, and helping us sing, this would not be the church for you anymore. Because they're like everywhere. <laughs> so it's fun to say, I was playing away, having a wonderful time worshiping the Lord, and I heard a bump, bump, bump. I looked down, and there's Jacob's little cup with all his cereal in it, bouncing down the stairs. So I thought, he's got to be up there help playing drums. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna, we usually take now a minute or so to do some announcements towards the end of the service. Uh, but I do want to say something about our next step fundraising. We don't talk a lot about fundraising in our church. We don't bash you up and pass offering plates and all that kind of stuff. But we set out the challenge just before Christmas to raise around 60000 to be able to bring our resources up to one full year of mortgage payments in cash on hand. That was a challenge from the bank. It's for our good that they're doing that, so that we don't, if we don't grow as fast as we think once we're in the building, it's going to take us months and months to build that place, and if we don't grow as fast as we think we're going to grow, that we have enough resource on hand for a full year of growth, and they want us to be able to have, that's our money, we're keeping it. So we set out the challenge, $60,000, as of this afternoon, Derek sent me uh, an email we're right now right around 37,000 out of that 60,000. So that leaves us 20 something, low 20 something. If we use all the available cash that we have available, we're actually much closer than that. So somewhere along the line, in the next week or two weeks, depending upon how you respond, what we do, we're gonna do fundraisers, we're gonna do all kinds of things to be able to bolster that as we go through the next year to be sure. But this part of the process is really us as a congregation putting our resources together to make it happen. And, and we're emphasizing this because for the rest of eternity, those people who contributed in this step are going to be able to say, we were the ones who made it happen. So your, or your gift might be 50 bucks or 100. That could be a big stretch for you, an act of faith. Could be a thousand, could be ten thousand. We've had gifts all along those sides, from ten dollars to ten thousand dollars. And what we're asking and hoping is that you pray about it, think about it carefully, and this is really the window. This is the opportunity. When we reach sixty thousand, or we're within sight of it, we're going back to the bank. We're going to see if we can get our mortgage green light, do all the processes, close, and get started digging. So get your shovels ready. Our Old Testament reading tonight is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, starting in verse 11 and reading to the end of the chapter. This is Moses' kind of summary review of the entire law. This is everything that was in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Forty years has taken place since they left Egypt. They had seen miracles. They had God had worked in their behalf. They visibly saw an apparition of God himself in the fire and the smoke. Moses saw him face to face. He gave the law, and this is Moses' summary of what God said. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in the heavens so that you have to ask who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No. 
The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart that you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven, the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. And I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land that he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our New Testament reading is from Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. Galatians chapter 3. We're kind of working through the book of Galatians in kind of an odd way. There's, in our devotions in the bulletin, different places that we're reading that. Eventually, you'll kind of cover all the book of Galatians, the book about freedom and the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with a promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party. But God is one. In the law, therefore, opposed is the law, therefore, opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But Scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised was given through faith in Jesus Christ. It might be given to those who believe. Our series over this winter time is Bones and Breath. The bones are what is firm, what is solid. Boundaries and laws, requirements precepts, statutes, the things that form your life. Everybody needs bones. Without them, you'd just be a puddle on the ground. You wouldn't be able to move. You couldn't walk. Your brain wouldn't be protected. You have to have bones. And that's a metaphor for rules and laws and expectations, demands, precepts, requirements. They're necessary in life. You can't live in total licentiousness, in absolute freedom. There have to be structures, and there are structures. They're good. But bones with no breath is simply a cemetery. You have to have breath, life, spirit, freedom, respiration, the ability to cleanse and renew, but not on a set schedule, not with rigid requirements. It's both bones and breath, not either or. Tonight we're looking at the strength of the law, the real strength of law. You make laws. You make them for yourself. You make bones. You create precepts and strategies and analyses. You come up with requirements. You demand of yourself and others certain things. If you have small children in your families, you'll have rules. Do not touch the stove. Don't walk outside by yourself. 
change your underwear every day or regularly if you have a teenage boy. Sometimes. Or at least once in your teenage years. I mean, you're going to have requirements and you're going to build expectations and demands. We did uh, some study about 20 years ago when I was in an organization called Sun Life on kind of frameworks or designs for personality within teams. It was really built around teams, but it works in families, it works in churches and organizations. It's not an absolute, it's not a correct way of seeing everything, but it gave people kind of a handle on how they fit in the organization in which they were participating in one way or another. It was called the DISC Personality Inventory, and there were about 75 or 80 questions that you answered, and then it scored, and you got a high D, a high I, a high S, or a high C, or some combination of those two. One of the things that was fascinating about all that study was how rules and boundaries work in the four personalities. The high dominant person, not always the leader of an organization, but the high dominant, the high D person, will have very strong requirements and boundaries for everyone else. They know how to direct, they know how to give commands, they know how to give orders, they know how to set up schedules, they know how everybody ought to be doing their job, but regarding themselves, they have kind of an easy, fluid set of rules. I know what you ought to be doing. I don't necessarily have to do that. Do as I say, don't necessarily do what I do. That's a high D personality trait. For me, it's not that I'm trying to get away with something. I just understand myself within the organization differently than I understand everyone else. Hmm. The high I is high influencing. The high influencing person doesn't really have rigid rules for anybody, for others or for themselves. They play the game kind of loose. It's always at the convenience of what works well for all of us. Salesmen are like this. If you get into uh, some kind of a situation where somebody's trying to sell something and they're willing to negotiate, if you're dealing with a high I, they're always going to come up with a win-win. They always want the rules to change so that everyone comes out okay. It's part of their personality and how they deal with boundaries. Bones are flexible. Sometimes they're made to break. Sometimes you pull them right out and still keep right on going so that everybody's happy. The high S is high steady. A person who likes the keel to be even, the waters to be calm, to make sure that everything gets done in a proper time, that the team is really holding together, and they have very strong boundaries, traditions, history, rules. It goes way back in time, goes way off into the future for everyone else and themselves. That's how we stay steady. We're not flexible. We don't change the rules we go along. We just hold to the things that have been, and we make sure we're going to do them. As long as you agree to that and I agree to that, everything is going to work out well. And the high C is the high compliant. The compliant person has an incredible number of rules for themselves, and they don't believe anyone is going to be able to live up to their standards. They know what they need to do, and they get it done. What anybody else does, I don't care. You can be off playing golf this afternoon, but I have work to do, and I'm going to get it done. So the high C has a sense of easy rules for others, but a strong sense of rules for themselves. So the question then is, are the boundaries that you have in your life just a function of your personality? Did they come from your family of origin, or do you live differently with different sets of rules and expectations than what you grew up with? Is it a function just of your habits, what you've always done and what you're continuing to do? Or can you change those things? It really has to do with everything from when you get up in the morning and how do you dress and where do you work, how do you spend your money? How do you consume all kinds of things from healthy foods to unhealthy foods, from beverages to 
all other manner of medications or whatever. You'll have standards for that. You have boundaries for that. You have rules that you or others are expected to live by. Can it be just cultural stuff? Fascinating discussion is going on just released today. The Supreme Court of the United States is going to decide about gay marriage. Once and for all. It's not once and for all. It's for this time and this age. What are the rules? How do we change them? What is expected? Where are the boundaries? 150 years ago, when state laws were written, they had to do with regulating behavior by law. It was not enough merely to create culture, to preach from the pulpit, or to be able to speak to your neighbor in order to be able to bring about a certain behavioral standard. Then it became a matter of local law and then state law. We were going to make good people by setting the rules. And now we live in an age where that's seen as not working. You can't regulate behavior. You can't make a certain kind of person because they obey all of the laws. So the question then is, what do the boundaries mean? And why did God give them? What does it, how does it apply, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? We read a little bit from Deuteronomy chapter 30. It is the summary at the end of Moses' life, looking back over the entire law. If you've ever decided to read through the Bible, I'll get I bet anything you hit right around the middle of Exodus and gave up. After the giving of the Ten Commandments and a number of the, the regulations that pertain, there is this incredible long passage about exactly how the tabernacle is supposed to be built. That takes about eight chapters to describe. And then they build it, and the details of building it are given. You're reading exactly the same thing about all the rules that were given in the first few chapters, and that takes about four or five chapters to be able to get that out as well. So you muscle your way through, you're bored as all get out, you get to the end of the, of the book of Exodus, the Spirit of God comes into the tabernacle, everybody's happy, you start Leviticus. That is even worse than the last 20 chapters you've read. So you pretty much give up on that, jump over to Numbers, and you start reading, there were 10,741 in Naphtali. And they were all mighty men, and they had wives, and, they, and you go, what? And then how many there were in Gad, and in Asher, and in, what? So you just finally say, ah, the Bible's worthless. But it's all in there for a reason. It means something. So rather than bore you to death, and read the entire book of Exodus, I thought, I'll just give you a quick summary so you see what's going on. The people of Israel are caught in Egypt. It's a metaphor for being caught in sin. Sin is a broken relationship with God. It's not, I did this one thing wrong. I'm guilty of an exact, explicit, specific point. But my relationship with God has been damaged. I've separated myself. And I'm not living in context of my faith with God. Being in Egypt was 400 years of slavery to another people that were not God. They worshiped their own God. They had the river. They believed in cycles. They looked at the spring and the rains and all that. And, that's, and the Israelites just believed what was going on in their households. They were servants and slaves in that community. But it was oppressive. And as time went by, it got worse. The wealthy people didn't want to keep having children, but the poor people, the slaves, were multiplying like rats. And they were the Israelites. So eventually there were far more Israelites than there were Egyptians. And they were mistreated and, tr and pushed down and kept in slavery. And the people began to cry out to a God they didn't know. To the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had had relationship with God but now there were people with no relationship with God. They only knew of him. They did not know him. So they cried out to God, and he heard their cry, and at the right time raised up Moses. Through a series of miracles, he delivered them from Egypt. We're going to pick up the story and do this real quickly. In Exodus chapter 12, there are rules that are given for Passover. It's incredibly simple. There is one meal... Here's how the meal is to be prepared. These are the requirements, God says. 
every person seated at the table who is male must be circumcised. No one can be uncircumcised. No worker, no sojourner, no guest can eat at that table unless they are circumcised. It is a bone absolute law. You cannot break it. That's the way it is. You cannot use yeast. Don't let the bread rise. You're not going to have time. I'm going to deliver you. I want you to be ready to go when I say go. So don't have your bread sitting in a, in a basket with a cloth over it waiting for it to rise so you have nice soft bread. Eat unleavened bread. That's the way it is. That is a bone. It is a requirement. You cannot change it. And Exodus 12 gives the boundaries about Passover. E Exodus 13 gives the boundaries about the firstborn. Why does the firstborn child and the firstborn animal belong to God? Now, you don't kill the children. You don't kill the animals. You, you bring them to God. You dedicate them as a foreshadowing of the firstborn of God, Jesus. But they didn't understand the final version of that. But the chapter 13 is about the laws, the requirements, the bones, the boundaries about the firstborn. It cannot be changed. That's the way it is. Exodus 14 is the boundaries about rescue. When God has heard your cry, he will step in and he is going to redeem you and rescue you. So there's all kinds of rules. As a matter of fact, he says, I know there's an easy way of getting to the promised land. You could divert and go right up through the land connection and get into the desert and get there. But I know what you're going to hit when you go that way. And I have some other things in store. So I'm telling you, do not go that way. Go towards the water and get caught so that I can do something miraculous in your life. You're going to see it happen. These are the requirements for rescue. Then in Exodus 15, the people are caught and they don't understand, and they begin to complain. It's the boundaries about complaint. And their boundaries are, we complain about everything. But particularly, we complain about having no clean water. We want water. And they grouse, and they're miserable, and they're nasty, and they're very upset. And it's all the rules about complaining about water, so God gives them water. In Exodus 16, it is the boundaries and rules and requirements about how God is going to provide by miracle, and also by ordinary culture. He's going to do both. It's not either or. These are the ways God will answer your prayers. In Exodus 17, there is boundaries about warfare, who you're going to fight, how you're going to fight them, what you're going to do to overcome. In Exodus 18, it is boundaries about justice. How do you solve discrepancies and conflicts? What are the rules that pertain to that? And, and already people are coming with all these issues and Moses says, I can't handle this. And, God's, and, God, and his uh, father-in-law comes up with a plan. In, invite people who are wise to be able to settle some of the issues. They will know what to do. Trust them. They've been with you all along. So it's rules about justice. Exodus 19 is the boundaries that pertain to holiness. What does it mean to separate something to God? And fascinating through all of this is a constant stream of griping. The people are miserable. They complain about everything. They don't like the water they get. They want wine. They don't like the bread they get. They want something soft. They don't like the meat they get. They're tired of quail. They don't like the direction they're going. They don't like the people they're with. They don't like, they don't like anything. And then we get to Exodus chapter 20. In Exodus chapter 20, God says, all right, you've complained enough. I've been listening to it now for months. You cried out to me, I delivered you. That wasn't good enough. So now I'm going to tell you what are my commandments. I'm going to give you my law. Now, it's interesting that it stretches on out through most of Exodus into Numbers and Deuteronomy and, and uh, through those next few books. It has to do with everything pertaining to what kind of garments you have and whether you can uh, boil meat in milk. And, and there's reasons for all of that. But it starts with the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. When Moses summarizes that, he says, you know, this is not too difficult. 
He's not asking you to climb uh, El Capitan with just your fingers in little tiny cracks scaling a sheer wall. He's not asking you to swim over the ocean and bring it back in a bottle in your teeth. It's, it's actually something you can do. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. The difference between obeying and not obeying is the difference between life and death, between blessing and curse. And we find out in the rest of the entire Old Testament, people consistently bash their own faces into the wall because they don't want to follow God's law. But it's actually fairly simple. He starts off by saying, here's commandment number one. I am the Lord your God. I'm going to tell you my name. I'm going to make myself available to you. That's the first commandment. Have a relationship with me. Know me. Don't think it's a system. It's not a system. I am the Lord your God. I delivered you from Egypt. The next three commandments, you will have no other God before you. There isn't one, but don't make up something to put in my place. Don't create an image or carve something out of stone or wood and bow down and worship it. Don't use my name in vain. That's not too hard to do. You may not want to do it, but it's really not too hard. He says, have a relationship with me. Don't have other gods. Okay, so something not to do. Don't make graven images. Great, we don't have to carve. Don't use my name in vain. Keep your speech ordinary and plain. Not so bad. You can do that. Take a Sabbath rest. On the seventh day of the week, stop working. Don't work so hard. Don't work yourself to death. That's a commandment. He's not saying you have to climb some gigantic mountain or swim some deep sea or hold your breath for 20 minutes in a row. He says, okay, you work. But then my command is, stop, rest, because I rested. He actually gives an explanation, which becomes a key to the whole law. He says, honor your father and mother. I created family. I designed you to be that way. I started Adam and Eve, but then I didn't go on and produce Cain and Abel and Seth and all their wives. I didn't individually mold them all out of dirt. The parents did that. That's my system. So I created, and you also create. You're like me. My image is in you. My design is in your heart. It's in your mind. It's in your life. You see, I worked, and I rested. So here's my command. You work, you rest. I created. I created life. So you create life and honor that, respect that. You will not murder, you will not commit adultery, you will not bear false te testimony, you will not covet your neighbor's property. Okay, those are things you're not to do. Don't do them. Don't murder. Well, what a relief. Phew, I don't have to go out and murder somebody today. Nice. I don't have to make up false testimony and lies that I have to keep track of. I can just, like, tell the truth. Whew, sweet. I don't have to covet and pretend that what I have is no good, that what everybody else has. I don't have to spend my life thinking about that. Those are the Ten Commandments of God. It's not too hard for you. It's easy for you to do. But here comes the strength of the law. It's not in the minuscule. It's not in the tiny little pieces. The law is God himself. It's who he is. It's his very nature expressed in commandment. Why should you have no other God and, and engage in idolatry? Because they don't exist. There's only one God. Worship him. Why do you take Sabbath rest? Because God himself rested and he wants you to be like him. Why do you honor that which created you? Because that's God's handiwork. That's what he does. Why do you not murder? Because he is life itself. Why do you not lie? Because he is truth. Why do you not steal? Because he is the giver of good things. So the law, the strength of the law, when lived properly, is to actually live in God, in his nature, in his name, in, his rela in a relationship with him. The problem is 
the law cannot give you life. In the summary of Moses at the very end, he does not say, if you do one, two, three, up to 600, if you do all the rules, you'll have life. He says, life is in me. Know me and live this way. So the strength of the law in, is in its revelation of God. In fact, if we go back to the DISC or the way you set up rules, the rules of your household, the rules for your life, that's an expression of you. It's who you are. Whether you have those rules as absolutes that are fixed and immovable, that's your personality expressed in the expectation. If they're all fluid and loosey-goosey and nothing really holds on, that's who you are. That's how you live. So law's strength is in the revelation of its maker. Now we're going to look next week at the weakness of the law because it has also an inherent weakness. The strength of the law is God himself. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we tend to think of the rules and laws as all outside. They're all set by somebody else and, and they're like fences. We either climb over them or break through them or just sit there and cry because we can't get past them. But the laws and the rules explain something. They're an expression. They're a revelation. They're a description. So the way in which we live expresses ourself, standards for ourselves and standards we hold for others. The way in which you have standards for yourself and standards for us. We want to see the law for what it is, not something to beat us up and bash us down, but what was originally designed to reveal you to a people who did not know you. So teach us your law. Teach us yourself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join us in singing this evening and worshiping our God? We've got a little different team here. We sometimes come to practice, and I don't really know who's going to be here or not be here, so it's a little bit different, but... I think it's good to roll with it sometimes, and God throws it at us, and we just got to trust in him and go with it. So let's sing and let's worship our to God together. Join our voices as one.
requests for the week that are up there on on the first uh, left and first top right is uh, the condition for our next step and so we're getting very very close um, we're within we're within stretch of it within reach so keep that in your prayers what you're able to do our military families are still there and if we have uh, changes people coming or going in military keep them in our prayers as well our president uh, Melanie Andrews sent a e uh, text to me just before church started that one of her boarders named Carol <clears throat> was kicked in the face by one of her horses and has gone to the hospital and it's a pretty dangerous situation. So Melanie asked for us to keep uh, Carol in our prayers and we said we would do that. Uh, Terry Tribus was not able to be here either. He said he was going to visit his Nana who is doing poorly health-wise 
and uh, he wanted to be able to visit with her uh, one more time. So uh, she is apparently in failing health. My mom is also the same. Uh, she's 95 or almost 95. I got uh, a text from my sister Mary saying she wasn't eating or drinking. I got a phone call on Thursday. She's eating and drinking again. She's perking up. She's okay. She's failing. She's okay. So it's one of those long, difficult times of transition for my mom as well. So keep us in your prayers. Other requests that you have you'd like to share tonight? Ways in which we can be praying. Yes, Lori, your mom. A lot of us were at that <clears throat> stage in life where that's happening for a lot of us. Our prayer song tonight is Breathe. This is the air I breathe.
that we breathe is a composite of all kinds of elements. Our bodies have within them impurities that we breathe out in respiration. It goes into that air, but somehow the air is not contaminated, even though billions of people have been doing that for a long time. You have a way of cleansing our bodies by the air. You have a way of cleansing the air. I don't know how you do that. There's a lot of things that I use that I really don't know how they work, but I know that they work. Prayer is like that. I don't know how it works. I don't know the mechanics of it. I don't know all the right words. But I know that when I talk to you, you listen. And when I listen, you speak. We come to sing and to pray, not because we have a big long list of stuff we need you to do as if you're our servant or our employee. You are God and we put no other God before you. Not even ourselves. We're not in charge. We come to discover who you are and how to live in a relationship with you in a way that works and works well in our lives so that we're not the same kind of people we would have been if we didn't know you, but we are different kinds of people. We bring before you our requests for people that we know, for our church and our building process, for Carol, who got kicked by a horse and is in a pretty dangerous situation. For a lot of our parents and grandparents whose health is giving out from age or from illness. But these are not things that we put before you and snap our fingers and then stand there with our arms crossed waiting for you to get something done. You asked us to bring our requests, our needs, and our desires to you and to lay them before you by faith. At times, you don't take us the easy route, but you take us by a difficult route where surely we are going to get caught so that you can show your power and your love in our lives. We don't understand it at the time, but you do make yourself known to us. So we desire to discover who you are by whatever means you will use. The law, the absence of law, grace and kindness, harshness and hard times. Teach us to hear your voice. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. My quick 60-second announcement because time is already going. Um, <laughs> just Valentine's dinner. I have tickets here available. You can pay with cash, check, or credit. Um, tickets are $16, and you can choose from spaghetti and meatballs, chicken, vegetable lasagna, and I do have a thing to eat, uh, a credit card, or a cash machine too. Um, February 8th, it's always a great night, so enjoy. Nice. <laughs> Promise time. Our
promise today <clears throat> comes from Psalm. The words of us to God. Sing to the Lord. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And that's a great promise, but that's not the one that was up there. <laughs> I read that one earlier. <laughs> Well, you got two promises tonight, one vocal. Let's go on and sing. We're already out of time. I guess we need to hear that one. <laughs> let's sing the let's sing to our Lord. Give us a praise. Grateful that you hear us when we shout 
my iPad is different from that too, so I'm going to read off of there. I, for some reason, we got it not right. We pray that we may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. Amen. Hey, man, have a great week. Have an awesome week. Awesome week. And a day it's going to be Monday, 40 right? tomorrow. Most schools, you have a day off Monday. My kids do, not me. sermon short. Which was what? Oh, you're an I. I'm an I. Is he an I? Oh, you're an I. I'm an I. Oh, yeah. Me too. We're eyes. What are eyes? Which one are We're like. <laughs> low standards for others and low standards for yourself. Whatever works. Whatever works. Easy going. Who cares what? Really? We're eyes? I don't know if that's good or bad. That means. No, it, it's not good or bad. Perfect. Everything's good. Everything. Everything can be bad. <laughs> Uh, a high D that has
like a different group and then to understand like especially if you're on a project together for a couple of years to kind of like yeah. understand like where they're coming, where they're from. coming from. I right. mean, if you've done it enough, you usually can try to guess what somebody else is and understand it, but it just kind of makes you aware and like when they come to you and say something, you understand like why they're saying it that way. Well, they'll say like that second part, right? I think they say it increases like when you're under stress right. sometimes and whatnot, but also that it can change. Like, so I remember when I was in high school, I was not an I at all. Like I was super like in, in school, like I was super shy and still not at church, but like in my personality was like, so different. And then after that, like at work, like as I grew and like didn't care as much about what other people thought, then well, like it, ch it changes. Promise. So Josh puts his own in, right? Josh's is different. He doesn't. He doesn't sync with us. So he must have put the wrong one in there. Or, but I definitely did not have the right thing either. Remember that song you did about that? Let's put it. 